Oh, joy of gardening presentation. We want to start thinking about spring. And so we add, uh, asked um, <clears throat> Cherry. Spirit, Cherry to join us today because she is certainly one of the well-known gardeners in uh, Fairbanks. Cherry. Oh, am I ready to go? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm going to use a slideshow. Uh, so if I can figure out how to get it up here, that's what we'll look at. And um, because it's much more fun to look at pictures than my face, really. I think you can see my face up on the side when we do this. So let's go. There's, so how's that work? Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, good. I put that picture up there to remind us that sometime soon, the world won't be white anymore. <laughs> That's hard to believe. <laughs> I asked Joy to um, find out if there are any topics or questions uh, that you wanted me to address. And she told me you had two, uh, new varieties and growing vegetables on decks or patios. <laughs> but she also said I could talk about whatever I want. <laughs> So I'm going to start off with something else and then move to both of those. And, and, and the something else is a question. Uh, and the question is, why grow anything? And, and the answer to that is, is my passion. And, uh, and it's why I go to the work of teaching how to grow vegetables. So I have to uh, give a plug to this topic. Um, here are a couple of reasons to grow your own vegetables. Uh, you care about our planet and you care about people. Let's see if I can figure out how this thing moves. Why can't I, uh, let's see, the arrow doesn't seem to move it. Why is that, Joy? Maybe I should have done a practice. So let's go this way. Nope, let's do that. Nope. Um, so the down arrow isn't moving it for you? Oh, there it goes. The down arrow just did. It didn't before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so there are numerous problems with our commercial food production system. And I want to point out five that are especially problematic issues. And the first is pesticide. Close to a billion pounds of um, pesticides, uh, of active ingredients in pesticides are used in agriculture in the US every year. And most of the hundreds of pesticides and herbicides that are used in commercial farming have serious health impacts. Studies show that there's widespread exposure of farm workers and their children and, and organophosphate pesticides, which are neurotoxins and carcinogens um, are, are um, uh, one of the major ones that we're aware of. Um, people also, experience widespread exposure to other less studied pesticide uh, chem chemicals that are in the pesticides that we really don't know that much about. But the result of this is a very high level of serious health problems for farm workers and their children. Um, almost 30% of municipal solid waste um, which is a huge problem to every community, including Fairbanks. Down there on the right is our landfill. That hill there is really all landfill. And it's made up of people's, 30% of it is made up of, of people's uh, food and yard trimmings, all of which could be composted and used to grow food. 40% of rivers, lakes, and coastal waters in the lower 48 are not fit to fish in, swim in, or drink from because they're so polluted. And then on top of this, roughly a third of the air pollution from vehicles in the US comes from growing, preparing, and transporting food to the kitchen table. 
So industrial agriculture is the greatest cause of both the air pollution and the water pollution. Our croplands account for nearly 40% of nitrogen pollution and 30% of uh, phosphorus pollution. We don't have information on the extent of other chemical contamination, such as pesticides or antibiotics. Globally, large-scale agriculture forces subsistence farmers off their land. It moves the land from individual or communal ownership into large industrial estates connected to foreign markets. The United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues says that tens of millions of indigenous people are at risk of losing their land to agribusiness. Certain parts of the globe will experience catastrophic results from climate change. And the cause of climate change is directly related to our consumption of carbon emitting fuels. Millions of barrels of oil are used each year to transport food to market, to run the machinery used to produce it, and to make large amount of chemical fertilizers used to grow it. As individuals, we can make a difference. We can find ways to use less energy and consume fewer resources. Growing your own food should avoid these impacts, especially if you grow organically and compost your waste. So if you're growing, growing vegetables, you're making the world a better place. Thank you. And of course, there are plenty of selfish reasons to grow your own vegetable. Food grown in your own garden is higher in vitamins and minerals and also tastier, and it stores better. And growing your own food can save you So is that me or is that someone else? <laughs> uh, there are many more varieties of vegetables that you can grow in your garden than can be found in stores. And cooking with homegrown food is a very different experience. The flavors are different, they're more intense, and you feel a sense of pride and satisfaction. The giving of thanks before a meal develops a whole new meaning. So now I'm gonna take both the topics that Joy got from you, new varieties and growing on decks and patios. And I'm gonna cover them together because there's, uh, there's some overlap. Um, it's really important to use appropriate varieties if you wanna grow in containers. Also, I had trouble dealing with the term new varieties. I, I can't talk about varieties I haven't tried. So I won't be covering varieties that are new in this year's catalogs. And then when I talk to people, I find that the term new has different meanings. For some people, New refers to a variety of vegetable that's being sold for the first time this year. For others, it refers to a plant or variety that might have been around for years, but they never heard of it, or they never knew it could be grown up here. So besides fairly new varieties, I'll also throw in some vegetable species that I'm guessing some of you might not have thought about growing. We have limited time, so I can't talk about how to grow any of them or even a lot of details. If you wanna know more, uh, I'd recommend you take my class. I offer it every year starting the last Monday of September. It goes for eight weeks and um, you can just give me a call. <clears throat> so to rephrase, I'm gonna zigzag back and forth through, um, through these topics. Some different varieties that are fairly new to me or perhaps you, and uh, also varieties that are good for growing on decks. And hopefully you'll find something of interest. So let's start off with beans. Uh, everyone likes fresh green beans. Hickok is a relatively recent variety. Uh, it's a bush bean and you can get it from Territorial Seed Company. I'm, I'm gonna try to tell you the name of uh, the seed of at least one seed company that you can get these varieties from. Um, and then you can also look them up on the internet. Um, 
Jade too is also in this picture. It's a beautiful bean, but it's no longer available, which is a common occurrence these days in the seed industry. Anyway, hickok is extremely productive. It's high quality and it freezes well. And another really nice trait is that it's resistant to powdery mildew. So uh, I'd sure give that a try. If you have some space at the back of your garden for a tall wire fence, uh, you could make it out of concrete wire, eight foot concrete wire. I'd recommend you grow pole beans and runner beans. Several pole beans do well, but Fortex is superb. It's not new, it's been around for quite a while, but I don't think any other pole beans approach its performance. It's very productive, always tender and tasty, even when it's a foot long. And I'd also encourage you to try runner beans. They're meatier than bush beans. And the great thing is that they're happy with the cool rainy weather we usually get in August that ruins most of the bush beans. In fact, they'll even handle a touch of frost. The best variety that's relatively new is Stardust from Park Seeds. <clears throat> it stays tender even when it gets quite large. And its seeds are wonderful as shell beans. You know, the Scarlet Runner seeds uh, uh, that a lot of you are probably familiar with also give great shell beans that are huge and delicious. This is a basket ready to steam and freeze. The pink lavender ones are scarlet runner. Some are almost black. And the white ones, not many of them in that batch, are uh, stardust. I also grow bush horticultural beans for shell beans. And until two years ago, I grew these Taylor beans, which are uh, pretty productive. But in the past two years, I found that a newly available one called light red kidney bean that I get from high mowing seeds is the most productive. I usually get my yield in mid to late August. Another one that's quite productive is uh, called Aricara with a K and it's from Prairie Road Seed Company. Um, I don't have pictures of either of those. Did you know that beans contain a compound called phytohemagglutinin? It's a protein that in high amounts causes nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. In fact, a large amount can kill you. So you should never eat raw bean seeds. Uh, as the raw seeds have very large amounts of it. In fact, one kidney bean has 70,000 units of it. Uh, once you cook that bean, it only has 200 to 400 units. So always cook your beans, even green beans. Boiling temperature breaks that down. So cook your green beans at boiling temperature for over five minutes and your dried or shell beans for at least 15 minutes at boiling temperature. Never cook them in a slow cooker because they don't get hot enough. A, a lot of toxins, like it's amazing how many toxins are in a lot of our vegetables, but uh, in small amounts, some of them are good for you. In fact, a lot of them have anti-cancer properties. You just don't want large amounts. Okay, root crops do great in Fairbanks. They can grow huge, and still they remain tender and tasty, as long as they have enough water. If you're new to the interior, most of you aren't, uh, from the lower 48, you think of big root crops as, um, oh boy, it says my internet connection is unstable. We'll see how long this lasts. <laughs> uh, you think of them as being tough and woody, but not here in Fairbanks. These boros are from Territorial Seed Company, and they grow bigger than any other beets, and they still are sweet and tender. Did you know that beets uh, it boost your athletic performance? They have high levels of nitrates, and nitrates are converted to nitric oxide in our blood, and nitric oxide causes our blood vessels to swell and expanded blood vessels more and oxygen also, also be, uh, beets have a compound called 
quercetin, which provides energy, sort of like caffeine. Quercetin also inhibits the inflammatory response in muscles, which is what contributes to fatigue and soreness. So regularly put beets in your diet. Now, one that's not especially new, but I, uh, I really want to push it is uh, kestrel. And you can get that at Fedco Seeds. Uh, it can't be beet for quality. It's solid red throughout with little or no zoning, has a really sweet flavor. And on top of that, it stores wonderfully right up to the next growing season. Most people aren't familiar with parsley root, which is like a smaller version of parsnip, but it's parsley. So it tastes like parsley. It's delicious by itself or mashed with potatoes or added to stews. You can get that from Fedco Seeds also. I try new varieties of carrots every year when they come out and there's still none as sweet as Bolero, which you can now get from Clifton Seeds. And there's also none that store as well. We store our carrots till mid-June when we're tired of them and eating lots of other things in the garden. There is a new variety called Triton, which at 10 inches long are the most uniform, perfect carrots you'll ever find. No matter how bad the growing conditions, there's no forking, no splitting, etc. On top of that, they have good flavor. However, since Stoke Seeds sold out its American business last year, it's one of the many wonderful Canadian varieties that we can't seem to get now. Drive to Whitehorse and you can pick up a packet of Tritons. And then you have to go through uh, <laughs> the border and you don't want to lie. Um, we all know potatoes do well in Fairbanks and there are lots of great varieties, but I think two pretty newly available fingerlings are worth growing. Uh, Magic Molly is solid purple throughout and Magic Myrna uh, which is dark gold internally, has great texture as well as a sweet flavor when it's stored in cold conditions. Uh, these potatoes were uh, developed in Palmer by Bill Campbell. I don't have pictures of Magic Molly. I take these pictures for my class, but when it comes to root crops, I, instead of pictures, I always bring in uh, samples. And so I don't take a lot of pictures. All potatoes, when they're stored in cold conditions for a while, uh, will become sweet. But Magic Myrna's flavor becomes so delicious, it's called Alaska's sweet potato. Magic Molly's, the purple one, are full of anthocyanins, phytonutrients, and other antioxidants. And they're so dark purple that you'll turn anything else you cook with them purple. So I either cook them by themselves or else with other purple things like red cabbage or red onions. You should know that potatoes have toxins. The best, one, the best known one is solanine. It quickly increases the toxic levels when potatoes are exposed to sun or when it's stressed or sprouting. Watch out for potatoes in grocery stores that are left out in the light. Light causes green chlorophyll to develop. Chlorophyll isn't toxic, but in potatoes, chlorophyll is always accompanied by solanin. So if you see any green color in their skin, stay away. The same is true if potatoes are sprouting. In both these situations, you can see the green or the sprouting and you can cut it away. Some people always insist on peeling their potatoes to be sure of avoiding it since it's concentrated right under and in the skin. Uh, but then uh, the skin and right under it are where all the vitamins are. So the best solution is to take care of your potatoes and not develop it. Another uh, toxin that always accompanies solanine is chaconine. If you avoid one, you'll avoid the other. A great regular sized potato is romance. I don't think I've seen it sold locally. It should be because it never gets scab. It's a very good producer and it isn't bothered by aphids if we have a bad year. And it stores wonderfully into the next growing season. 
I originally got mine from a place called Potato Garden in Colorado. And I looked it up yesterday to make sure that they still sell it. And I just saw that um, uh, they closed their business in May. I think it's sold in Canada because I've seen results of Canadian agricultural tests of it. I have never seen a potato so resistant to scab. I keep my potatoes from year to year. So I think next year I'll give some out to people in my class if no one else is selling it. So enough of root crops. If you have a little extra space in your garden, well, maybe a bunch of extra space, think about growing asparagus. It comes up by itself every spring and it's loaded with antioxidants and vitamins and it tastes wonderful, whether cooked or raw. Asparagus does very well in Fairbanks if you have the right variety. And there's only one variety that's right for Fairbanks. It's called Gulf Millennium and is, it's sold by Johnny Selected Seeds this year. I planted this variety around 18 years ago when Canada was producing it. Uh, and we eat asparagus almost every day starting around late May and continuing through most of June. There are some tricks to growing it uh, which I wish I had time to talk about, but um, it's a great plant. A relatively new variety of cucumber is called Martini. You can get it at Territorial Seed Company. It's a blonde cucumber that's very prolific and incredibly crisp and very resistant to powdery mildew. I don't have pictures of it growing, um, but I do have pictures of it pickled <laughs> besides the, but it's also a very tasty uh, salad cu cucumber. The skin is non bitter and it makes a really crisp pickling cucumber. Uh, you know, a pickle is just a cucumber that's persevering. Martini is parthenocarpic, which means that it's asexual, so it's seedless. Um, if as long as you don't have other cucumber varieties around it. Also, it doesn't have a detectable level of cucurbitacins in it. Those are compounds that make the skins bitter, which is why a lot of people peel their cucumbers. If you grow parthenocarpic varieties, you won't have to deal with that. And since we're on parthenocarpic cucumbers, I'll push the best slicing cucumber, which has been around for quite a while sweet success and Park Seed sells it. Uh, it not only has tender non-bitter skin, it's seedless. It's also hardy and grows well outside. Actually, Martini does well outside also. Uh, sweet success is resistant to powdery mildew and it's incredibly productive of 10 to 12 inch cucumbers like those expensive European cucumbers in the supermarket that are wrapped in plastic, only they're much tastier. Uh, and these are slicing cucumbers, not for pickling, so uh, don't try to pickle them. You can grow cucumbers on your patio. The more space you give the roots, the more productive they'll be. This picture has a sweet success in the box. Let's see if I can get a cursor there. So there's the cucumber plant. And uh, there's a sweet success cucumber. I think martini would do a lot better since it's a smaller plant. Uh, and I'd really recommend that for your patio. The earliest and the most dependable sweet corn you can grow is an old fashioned SU variety. Uh, I get it from Reimer Seeds. And it will, it's called early sun glow. It will produce an even or worse cool rain every day summers. It's not quite as sweet as the sugary enhanced varieties, but it's mighty good. But a newer variety worth growing is called cafe. If you think we'll have a halfway reasonable summer, uh, you can get it from Fedco. It's very sweet, it's productive and pretty early with 14 to 16 rows of kernels on an eight inch ear. 
Lattice works great in containers on your desk, on your deck. And it's really pretty mixed with flowers. So if you have a flower garden, put some lettuce in the flower garden because it'll make the flower garden look prettier. I'm not gonna go into lettuce varieties. There are new ones every year. A lot of the newest ones are patented, which makes them very expensive and not able to be reproduced by anyone else. I strongly recommend you purchase open pollinated varieties that aren't patented. They're just as lovely and a whole lot cheaper. But don't limit yourself to lettuce. There are a bunch of different greens you can grow in flower boxes or pots. And there's more to greens than spinach and kale. Some mustards like mizunas and bacanas do great. Both of these grow so fast that you really have to work to keep up with them and keep their flower buds picked. In fact, I always start some Tokyo Bacana in March so that we're eating it like lettuce in April. It's very mild and tender and a great lettuce substitute. And look at the tiny little cells that I grow it in when, uh, you know, before the season starts when you're inside. I cut it once a week when it's in these little cells and it feeds a nice salad for two of us. If you're gonna grow and harvest it that intensely, you really need to fertilize it with a good nitrogen source. But with such a little bit of soil, it's sort of like growing it hydroponically. So these would do great in pots. If you have a little bit more soil for them, you could include plenty of compost and skip the fertilizer. Now I wanna put in a plug for barley for those of you who have gardens. <clears throat> Most of us don't think about growing grain, but it's so easy. And my family gets enough yield of barley to meet our needs for a year. Sunshine barley, which was developed at UAF, is quite high in nutrients and protein, and it's really tasty. It's also holeless, so that it's easy to thresh and doesn't have to be pearled. You can use it in place of rice which is incredibly demanding of resources when you grow it, especially of water. Rice doesn't have much, of a, much in the way of nutrients, and of course it can't be grown in Alaska. But even if you don't wanna grow it, try buying it locally and substituting it for rice. It's a little chewier, which my family likes, and much tastier. It also makes a nice flour for quick breads and anything that doesn't need gluten. Peppers are something you can grow in the garden and on your deck. Sweet Savannah is from Stokes. It's a, a fairly new banana pepper that is an early heavy producer of long yellow peppers. I think it's the most uh, productive sweet pepper I've grown. And again, I guess you need to drive to Whitehorse to get it. Maybe someone in the US will sell it next year. Somehow our trade agreements with Canada in recent years have made it almost impossible to deal with Canadian seed companies, which is really too bad for us in Alaska because Canada is constantly developing varieties for cold climates and our state doesn't do much of that. There are numerous other great peppers that are incredibly productive and tasty. None of them are bells, all of them much tastier than bells. I really encourage you to try some, uh, but a number of them do very well in pots on the deck. Red Crest from Rhymer Seeds is one. It's very productive of large, sweet, red Italian style, delicious peppers. Another that'll give you orange peppers is uh, Mohawk. You can get that at Pine Tree. Um, and then super chili, I love, is uh, very productive of hot little peppers. One or two are just the right amount for a dish. The nice thing about growing these peppers on your deck is that when frost comes, you can bring them inside to continue ripening. Put them under a light and some of them, some of them will produce most of the winter. Shishito is another one that does great on decks. Uh, you can get this at high mowing seeds. 
Uh, it's mild. It's uh, usually sweet when they're red. It's thin walled and a great snack. Uh, it really adds color to your dishes. Uh, every once in a while, you'll get a hot one as a surprise. There are some new onions on the scene that do well up here. Onions are night sensitive. And so it's important to grow ones that are bred for long days. Otherwise, you'll find them bolting before they have much of a bulb. There are a lot of tricks to growing onions, which I can't talk about here, but there's no reason you can't get your year's supply from your garden. Before I talk about new varieties, I'm gonna push a couple of old ones. Elsa Craig is probably the easiest to grow up here. Uh, and it's one that's been around for a while. You can get it from Johnny's. It's a large Spanish type onion and it will store into January usually. Dakota Tears um, is one of my favorite storage onions that's open pollinated. Uh, I get it from Prairie Road Seed. It's the second from the left in this picture. It stores well for a year. Because it's open pollinated, I can uh, start it up and grow it again the second year and collect my own seeds. Onions are biennials. A relatively new large onion that stores very well for a year is Yankee. Uh, Johnny sells it. Don't store your onions in a root cellar. They need to stay in a dry environment and don't store them in the um, uh, you know, humid drawers of your refrigerator either. Uh, they need to be dry. We store ours in our entryway. My husband set up a thermostat that blows air in from upstairs if the entryway gets too cold in midwinter. Most of the time we can keep it just under 40 degrees. 35 would be ideal, but that's getting a little too close to 32 for my comfort. Finally, a pretty new one to try up here is called Zebrun. Uh, actually, I think it's a couple years old. Uh, I get it at Park Seeds. And it's what's called a banana shallow, which is a cross between an onion and a shallow. They're mild, they're easy to grow, they store well, and they're much bigger than the normal shallows. And if you don't want to mess with onions, leeks are easy and mega thun from Johnny's can't be beat for size. No, it's not new, but not all of you want to mess with onions. <clears throat> a lot of herbs are easy to grow in your garden, but also do really well in pots on your deck. Here you see some Thai bays on the left and cutting celery on the right. <clears throat> I like the large leaf uh, basil or the Genovese basil for pots. You can grow each herb in its own pot or put a bunch in, of them together in a container. <clears throat> when the weather starts turning cold, you can bring them inside and put them on a windowsill. I cut a branch off a mint garden. Peppermint doesn't generally make it through the winter. I just stuck it in this little jar with some water where it grew roots. Then I slowly added soil. If plants grow roots in water, <clears throat> The roots are usually what we call water roots. You don't want to suddenly change over, whoopsie daisy, what is going on? <laughs> well, okay, hold on. I hear my computer doing weird things. Um, you don't want to uh, suddenly change from water to soil for a plant that started out in water. Uh, so you just gradually add that soil until its roots change over to ones that can uh, survive in soil. Anyway, the plant in this little jar just kept going all winter long, makes a wonderful tea. The, um, let's see, let's see here. This parsley was dug up outside and brought in for the winter. I think this picture is in winter when the plants haven't been getting enough light, but even so, it's really nice to have that fresh flavor in dishes. Uh, here's some rosemary, here's some thyme. They're inside in these pictures, but you can see that they do fine in pots. And all these herbs do really well outside on your deck in the summer. 
really the only herbs that you probably don't want on your deck are the really tall ones, unless you can keep them uh, cut down enough. And then there are tomatoes. There's no new variety that beats out the old standby glacier for growing outside the garden. There are varieties that produce larger tomatoes, but none of them produce tastier tomatoes in our climate because the flavor enzymes in tomatoes are very temperature dependent. Glacier is the only variety I, I found whose flavor can stand up to the cool weather we get in Fairbanks. However, there are tomatoes that do well on a deck as long as you bring them in on cold nights or in that cool rainy weather that we get. They do fine in pots. <clears throat> one pretty new one that I don't have pictures of is 42 Day. Uh, it's from Territorial Seed Company. And uh, it's, whoopsie, it's uh, as fast to produce as its name. Very productive, very good tasting. And it's short enough so that it doesn't need support. And so you can carry it inside if it gets cold. Um, I've grown it for a couple of years. If you get it going in time and transplant it into its permanent pots in mid-April, you'll be eating them in June. One of the challenges of growing tomatoes on your deck is that they get tall and need support. And then they become difficult to haul inside when we have a cold spell. I deal with this issue by training the plants to hang over the edge of their pot. I use just that green frog tape and uh, you have to be sure to do this while the vines are still young and supple. If you happen to break the stem, you can tape them back together. Uh, use a little support, or you can use tomato paste. <laughs> um, and then I set the pots up on something like a shelf or a railing where they have plenty of room to hang. I run quarter wire containers to hang them, and then I can easily hang them in my greenhouse where they're out of the way. If I, um, so I do that whenever I have to bring them inside. <clears throat> One trick to training the vines is to give them a little support at the edge so that the stems don't crack at the stress point. See that little bit of old rubber hose that's underneath of them. A little tape makes it secure. Another way to speed up brightening is to cover your plants with some kind of transparent cover whether it's a greenhouse or a kind of high tunnel or whatever. Maybe on your deck, you can hang a plastic teepee from an eave. The speed of ripening is all dependent on temperature. And with our summers getting cloudier and rainier, we can no longer count on enough warm sunny days to do the job. There's so many different purposes, uh, different varieties for different purposes. A few types you may not be familiar with are paste or Roma tomatoes, which are great for sauces and for canning because they're not very juicy. And I grow those on my deck. And then I bring them inside to do the final ripening. The most productive I've found that's still available is a variety called Yaki. It's a determinant. Another uh, variety uh, of uh, Roma tomato is called Sunrise Sauce. It's a pretty new orange paste tomato. It's got really good flavor and it's really fun for making a different colored sauce that's uh, really pretty. And I don't have pictures of uh, Sunrise Sauce. Another type of tomato you might be interested in if you have a greenhouse are storage tomatoes. The two varieties that I store through February are Red October and Golden Treasure, both from Territorial Seed Company. We've stored both of these into February, by which time we've eaten them all up. So I really don't know how long they'd store. And I'll say that even in February, they taste a lot better than your grocery store tomatoes. There's really no comparison. Here's what tomatoes do for a red cabbage salad in midwinter. 
and then finally, before I stop, I, I just want to uh, let you know that there are numerous fruit trees and shrubs that do well in Fairbanks. Um, you can order, we've got apple trees. Uh, this is a crab apple tree that we get, uh, we do all our apple butter from. Um, back here is one that we like to eat from for uh, just uh, eating out of hand. I can never process all the apples for apple butter on this tree. Uh, we get so many cherries from the Evans cherry tree that, that are delicious and uh, make wonderful cherry uh, jam. And then of course there are the honeyberry plants, a lot of you. And there are others. You can order bare rootstock from the lower 48, or you can get uh, varieties that are tested and raised locally from Steve Masterman. And if you're interested, uh, you can find Steve's uh, site on the internet. Um, here's his um, web site. Um, and there's so much I didn't cover. Hopefully I met some of your expectations. What kind of questions do you have? Let me, let me get out of this, I think. Stop share. Do you have any questions? You may have to unmute yourself. I think we yeah. muted a lot of people. Yeah. Terry, can you spell the, um, you said Fide, Fideo, Fideco or Fideo company, is that for the corn? Fed How do you spell that? F-F-E-D-C-O. Oh, okay. I did have it right. Okay. Well, I have a question about potatoes. If you do have some scabbing on them, do you peel them or do you just wash them thoroughly? It doesn't hurt you at all. Oh, um, okay. But if the scab, go, and usually the scab you get is just on the surface. Yeah. So it's, it's just unattractive, but it can grow. If it's bad, it'll get down into the potato and that you want to cut out. And then plant clean potatoes the next year. Oh yeah, yeah. Can we grow sweet potatoes here? Well, I, I know some people who have gotten a couple of sweet potatoes with a huge amount of effort uh, in containers, in greenhouses, not really. I have another question. How do you deal with the worms and the voles and little things that get into the root vegetables? So um, <clears throat> most of the pests for root veg vegetables, well, there are two. And you saw that by either um, uh, growing your vegetables under netting to take care of root maggots because although the maggots are what eat your roots, it's the flies that lay eggs by the roots. And so you want to prevent the flies from getting to your root crops. So uh, crops like turnips and onions and rutabagas will need to be grown under netting. Um, and then Cutworms can be managed by rotation. So make sure you rotate your crops. If you plant bean, well, green be bush beans in the same place year after year, you may get eaten down by cutworms. And uh, cutworms will come into your coal crops. Um, and there's a way, if, if you can't uh, rotate, that you can put, um, uh, just put a nail beside the stem of each coal crop and mm. your cutworm won't um, hurt it. Or, or you can uh, put something around it, like a newspaper collar. Vol what about- Keep a trap line going for voles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do it, you can't quit. <laughs> what about 
uh, wood ashes, do they help in any way? Wood ashes are a great fertilizer. I use wood ashes instead of lime because it's got a lot more in it besides the calcium that lime has. But uh, generally speaking, no. Wood, uh, slugs don't like to crawl over wood ashes, but then when it rains, you know, that's sort of defeated. Mm -hmm. so, so wood ashes are good for a fertilizer uh, to use in place of lime or to spread on your garden as soon as it stops snowing these days when the sun comes out <laughs> uh, to darken it and it will get the snow out of there a lot faster. Oh, I have a question about onions. I've been uh, growing onions since I took a class from you several years ago, but my onions never get the size of yours and I'm very envious. <laughs> I cover them with a netting and, uh, but anyway, I was, if they have to, do you leave them in the ground for a longer period of time or? So, so it depends on uh, the onion. They're so night sensitive that daylight has a lot to do with when they mature and fall over. So for example, an onion called mountaineer um, will mature and start to fall over the 1st of August or towards the end of July. So that's not a very long season, whereas Elsa Craig will go right into the 1st of September. So it has a longer growth period. Uh, so it depends when you start them. Uh, I, when I learned that down in Minnesota, they start their onions in January now, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I start uh, some of my onions in January and the rest in February. I wonder if you start them that soon. Well, I started mine in January. They're wow. under the stairwell, under a light. I give them a haircut every week and a half or so. So they get, they get their little crew cut. And I was so proud of my starts last year, but it is still a struggle for me to get them to grow to a, I think a larger size. And I just used the last of them. So I'm really proud that, you know, nice. we had all winter. Uh, and my goal is to get them to grow a little bit larger. Do you have plenty of sun? Yes, I've always had good sun. And so last, then, last fall, I put a lot of uh, composted horse manure. That's what I had access to. Good. So I put that in the garden and I've let that sit all winter. Okay. Hopefully I don't have a lot of chickweed, but I'm, you know, it's a lot of Fertilizer, the soil should be nice and warm and I'm gonna see how, how that does. And dig a little bit of ashes under those rows because ashes have uh, available phosphate. Um, oh, okay. And phosphate is what makes for big roots, but it sounds like you're doing everything right. Maybe you'll have big onions this year. Oh, well, I'll cross my fingers. Do you have any suggestions for keeping herbs going you know i have them on the deck in the summer and i always bring them in before frost but i never seem to manage to really have them survive very long and i don't know uh what Put one them under them. light yes uh, i don't have special grow lights but you know i have access to light and uh we put our herbs in, in a window mm -hmm. and uh, our table that's both an eating table and a work table um, is right there. So it has good lighting. And yeah. um, recently we've put this LED strip of lights yeah. that gives us great lighting, but also provides nice light for the herbs. Usually December, uh, and January are pretty lousy times for herbs. And uh, if you can keep them going through that, uh, then they regenerate. Otherwise you may have to say, well, you've got them through December and start a new batch. And yeah, if February. that long, yeah. 
I did manage to keep my chai plant alive, but that's, you know, Whoa. yeah, right. I feel <laughs> real proud of that, but I don't know what I did really that, you know, the others didn't get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cilantro uh, does great. I mean, we love cilantro, thyme, rosemary. Yeah. Oh, one herb that does great in pots, uh, just as indestructible as lemon balm. I like to make a tea out of that. And uh, I have gone away for a month and left it um, with a house sitter who never does anything to it. And it looks like it's dead when I get home, but I'll water it. And there's always a few little sprouts there that come back and uh, it recovers. That's a good one. How often do you need to prune the basil when you're growing it? I usually get some leaves coming up and then all of a sudden the whole plant dies. So and I don't know what I'm doing do, wrong. Do the leaves turn sort of black? Yeah, they kind of curl in on themselves and they turn a little blackish. So that's because of temperature. It's too cool for them. Basil is extremely temperature uh, ah. dependent. Really doesn't like temperatures under 50 or <laughs> really doesn't like temperatures under 60. But uh, once you get under 50, you're going to get those black leaves and it's going to go. There are some recent varieties out um, one is called Eleonora um, that if you look in seed catalogs, do a little better, but that's one reason it's so nice to put some basil in a pot and just bring it in on those cold nights. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, if Happy not, gardening season. Yeah. If <laughs> not, uh, I'd like to thank Terry for sharing this uh, with us. It's been uh, very interesting. I've written down, you know, 30 varieties here. <laughs> I may or may not get to, but I'm glad to have it. Thank you. Okay. You're hey, welcome. Thanks, Terry. Fun to see all of you. Yeah, I'm going to let my tomatoes droop a little more. I always make it fun <laughs> to try to make them stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Good deal. Maybe one maybe. other question. There are people who talk about hanging their tomatoes upside down on purpose. Do you recommend that? So uh, I prefer to train them over the edge of a container than to put them upside down. Um, they don't, they have more space if they first grow up a little and then down, uh, than if they start right down. And it's just a whole lot easier to handle. Um, if that makes sense. You do that, I think. Thank you. It was popular for a while to have those yeah. upside down uh, plant holders, but I don't think they're, they retain their popularity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Okay. Shall Thank I hit? You. Do I hit leave? Uh, no, you you can stay. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants to say, you're certainly welcome to. But uh, we'll say we're officially over. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi, <laughs> it was fun. Thank you. Good. Thank you.